Sarah, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. Hi, guys. How are you? It's been a while. It feels like it's been so long since we were on. Um, so I've been putting together a PowerPoint for today. Uh, I know a lot of people, we did a, a little survey, I think probably a couple months ago, asking what uh, people wanted to hear about and what people wanted to learn about. And this was one of the biggest uh, requests. So uh, laminitis is something that a lot of people are, are dealing with and their horses are suffering from. And I thought it would be a really great one to tackle because it's a very misunderstood disease and it has so many causes and so many solutions. Uh, so it's, it's a very multifaceted um, disease that I think really needs to be broken apart a little bit so we can understand why it happens. And then from there, then we can figure out what the best way to, to get them to feeling better prevent future flare-ups, all of that kind of stuff. So I did put together some slides so that I don't forget anything. I'm gonna try and just fly through them as fast as I can, because I, I have a feeling we're probably gonna have quite a few questions. So I uh, will just quickly share my screen with you guys. Steph, if you don't mind letting, or somebody in the chat, if you don't mind letting me know if um, looks you perfect. can see my screen. Yeah, we we'll see you. This is awesome. Okay. And then make it bigger. There we go. Okay. So yes, today is all about navigating laminitis and Cushing's disease. Uh, I'm going to also talk about uh, equine metabolic disorder, which is also known as insulin resistance, which is a factor for laminitis development as well. So um, if you guys don't know who I am, um, my name is Sarah, and I am the equine director for Adored Beast Apothecary. And I work with Julianne Lee. Uh, we do all the formulations for the products uh, on the equine side. And uh, we, we've been partners together for over a year, but I've known Julie for 20 years, uh, even longer than 20 years. And I used to work at her veterinary clinic with her. So she's been my mentor for a very long time and helped me to uh, learn so many things about taking care of myself and also all of my critters, including my horses. <laughs> so um, I love the way she thinks and she's really helped me to understand how to take a bigger, a bigger kind of bird's eye view of disease rather than just looking at what's happening right in the moment. And that's something you really have to do with laminitis. So what exactly is laminitis? Um, as far as most horse owners see, they, they see that their horses are in pain. It's a destructive uh, situation. Uh, it's very, very painful. It causes inflammation of the laminae, which is a special tissue that's found in the feet. It, it connects the pedal bone to the hoof. And if it's inflamed and being destroyed, it can actually cause sinking and rotation of the bones and some horses do have to be euthanized because of this situation. So it's really important to catch it early um, and understand the reason why it might've developed and uh, helping them to work their way out of uh, the reason why they're having so much systemic inflammation. And there's lots of lots and lots of alternatives and integrative things that you can do alongside with veterinary care. Often these guys do need some veterinary intervention if it's really severe. So we're going to talk about all the things that you can do uh, to hopefully work 
your way back out of a laminitic episode. Um, it's really important to understand that laminitis is systemic. Uh, it's not just uh, in the legs and in the feet. It's actually a systemic issue uh, and it involves the cardiovascular system, the endocrine system, the immune system, and also the nervous system sometimes. So that's why it's really important to take a look at all of those systems and assess the situation and understand exactly why this is happening. And so we'll talk about that in a second. So itis, anything that's itis, laminitis, uh, any other kind of itis is inflammation. So, uh, you know, it's uh, in some many holistic uh, practitioner's eyes, Chronic inflammation is basically the, um, the cornerstone of the development of any chronic disease uh, from autoimmune diseases, cancer, any type of chronic illness. So if we look at it that way, it makes it a little bit easier to um, look at it in a way that's not so scary because uh, it can be rather stressful when, when this all starts to happen. Um, you know, your mind always takes it to the worst case scenario, which is often not a very nice situation. So it's really important to remember that chronic inflammation can be mitigated. It, it is really just about um, staying really open to how to approach it. And with laminitis, you really do have to do that because uh, it's so multifaceted. So um, yeah, basically just always be thinking that if, if your horse has laminitis, it means that they have some pretty, uh, developed cellular stress and oxidation. So it's really important to understand and identify where that's coming from. And, um, it also, it just needs to be in the forefront of your mind so that, uh, you know, it, it should be something that we're always trying to mitigate before these things come up. But if you've inherited a horse that's already kind of close to that, obviously, and also when you get an older horse, um, you, you know, you may not have as much control over that. So we'll talk about all of that as well. Um, so there's three different types of laminitis and, uh, or basic causes of laminitis. Um, so there's inflammatory associated laminitis, overload supporting limb laminitis, and endocrine, uh, it develops from the endocrine dysregulation. So those are the three different kinds. So inflammatory associated laminitis is usually the most common reason for that is dietary. It can be from starch overload. So really high sugar hay, but more, more often um, processed feeds that are too high in starch. Um, those are oftentimes a, a very big contributing factor. Um, drugs like death, dexamethasone and prednisone, those uh, uh, synthetic steroids that can mimic the um, corticosteroids, those can also cause a laminitic state, especially if they're given over long periods of time, and also vaccinations. So some veterinarians call uh, drug or vaccination-induced laminitis um, chemical-induced laminitis. So that, that is a recognized term that veterinarians use. Um, I personally, at my own barn here have seen a horse that got shod and had a vaccine the same day and went into a laminitic episode and he had never had anything even close to that before. So, and he was in really good shape. So it did resolve after some uh, major care, but um, that those kind of things, putting too much stress on the horse at one time, um, especially with, uh, with these kind of chemical inputs, and it can 
really throw them for a loop. So that's important to remember. Um, overload or supporting limb laminitis is usually when the front limbs become more, um, look, they, they, they start loading more weight than they should be. So generally the front limbs take about 60% of the total weight of the horse. And when they uh, have any hind end lameness, that can start to put more pressure on those front limbs. Um, really drastic changes in farrier work can also do that. So cutting the, the toes too short too quickly, um, taking shoes off when they've had shoes on for a really long time, um, that can change the amount of pressure that's uh, developing in the feet. It changes the circula circulation of the foot. Um, and also, uh, you know, the wrong shoes, the wrong angle of the foot, all of that kind of stuff. Um, obesity is a number one factor with this type of laminitis. Yeah, it can cause a lot of extra strain on those front limbs. And road founder is another one. So people who ride their horses on the road or on really hard surfaces, concrete, um, those, those horses may be at risk for developing laminitis as well. Um, and then this is probably the most common one, which is endocrine uh, laminitis. So it's a metabolic disease. It's derived from some kind of metabolic dysregulation. So this can be from Cushing's disease, which a lot of people know what that is. We'll talk more about that in a sec. And then insulin resistance, which is also called equine metabolic syndrome. So IR or EMS. And um, this inhibits their ability to control their carbohydrate metabolism. So, and it's a really vicious cycle. So we'll talk more about exactly what's, what's going on with those two diseases. Um, so according to science, the, um, the most common causes of laminitis are diet, was one of the biggest ones. So low quality forage is a huge one. Um, not enough fiber and too much starch. Uh, if you're reading your hay analysis, um, if it's got a high uh, NSC, that is the type of starch that the horse can turn into sugar very easily. So if that's not countered with some kind of uh, really heavy fiber, then it can, it can start to increase insulin, which is one of the key factors in the development of laminitis. We'll talk about that, how that happens. Um, grass is sometimes a factor, but we're gonna talk about grass as well in a minute um, and my personal opinions on, on what gra why grass is a problem for, for some horses. Um, Glyphosate is another one. If anyone who's heard me talk before knows I drone on about glyphosate all the time. Uh, so it's also known as Roundup. It's an herbicide. It's heavily, heavily sprayed on a lot of um, uh, feed ingredients. So uh, beet pulp, soy, wheat, corn, alfalfa, highly sprayed, um, any other type of legumes. Uh, unless they're orga certified organic or non-GMO'd, um, they will usually contain some level of glyphosate, which is an endocrine dysregulator, which is really important to remember because if your horse has a metabolic disease, this is a real problem for them. Um, it's also a patent patented antibiotic, which means it affects the gut microbiome and uh, I think many other systems in the body because of that. And then it's also uh, been uh, proven to be a cancer causing agent as well. So something you don't really wanna be feeding your horse every day or yourself for that matter. Oops, sorry guys. Uh, stress and cortisol. This is another one that is a hu hugely overlooked on a regular basis. Um, I know we all do the best that we can for our horses. And um, 
sometimes it's hard to get the perfect living situation for them. Um, but a lot of conventional equine management puts a lot of stress on the horse and it can increase cortisol quite significantly. And if you're increasing cortisol, you're affecting the pituitary gland, the adrenal gland, insulin regulation, all of this type of metabolic um, dysregulation. And if they're staying in that high stress state chronically over long periods of time, uh, plus they have uh, you know, something up with their diet, they have a lot of glyphosate in their diet, um, a lot of these horses, uh, you know, you, then you would maybe at some point they need to go on a, a medication and then boom, like that's the final straw. So it's really important to understand that all of these categories, you know, you could have one on its own and it would be a stressor. But if you have multiple layers of, of these things going on, you're exponentially increasing your horse's chance of being at risk for uh, insulin resistance, Cushing's disease, and or laminitis. So all three. Um, overuse of medications is another big, big issue in the equine industry in general. Um, antibiotics, NSAIDs, very... Um, disturbing to the gut microbiome, which can affect any system in the body, including the metabolic system, including the neurological system, um, even the circulatory system, which is a really big factor when you have laminitis going on. Um, dexamethasone is probably the number one culprit and prednisone as well. They, they're, um, you know, all that will, will um, openly, you know, explain those risks to you if you're horse ever has to go on those medications. And then sleep disorders are another one that are not really thought about very often, but if your horse is not sleeping properly, they have insufficient bedding, um, they don't have a comfortable place to lie down, or they actually have some sort of um, narcoleptic disorder, which can happen as well, um, or, or where they don't go into full REM sleep or full deep sleep, um, this can be a contributing factor because it's a huge uh, stressor and can increase cortisol. So I just wanted to throw that one in as well. Um, and yes, let's talk about grass. <laughs> uh, so grass is not the enemy. <laughs> uh, grass can become a problem for horses when they're already in a compromised state. So in the best case scenario, a young horse would go out on grass and have access to grass, access to movement, healthy food, uh, you know, good exercise program, uh, you know, low stress life. Being out in the field actually decreases stress and cortisol so much. It decreases ulcer risk, colic risk, a whole bunch of things. So it has a has really important um, health benefits. It's when a horse is already stressed, they go out onto very lush grass um, that, you know, they may not be able to handle that. So um, there's a time and a place for grass, um, but a lot of horses will actually be able to eventually go back on grass it has to be done correctly and it has to be done really slowly. Um, I know Julie has at least two, possibly three um, Cushing's and EMS horses in her rescue and they all go out on the grass. They all get turned out every day. Um, so, and she's a really big believer in that too. So um, it just has to be done appropriately because it can be done where it, it becomes a stress for them. Um, so grass doesn't cause laminitis. There has to be an underlying metabolic issue going on where they're not able to regulate their um, sugar properly for, for them to actually have an issue. So the stress is already there. 
and then you're just kind of putting the straw, the last straw on the on the hay pile, right? So you just don't want to um, mess with it if you've got a horse that's growing a lot of hair, you know, is is overweight, um, all of those classic uh, Cushingoid kind of symptoms. Um, they may be hot and sweaty and all of those things. You don't want to just throw them out on the grass, obviously. Um, some other things have to happen before that happens. So the other problem with pasture is that a lot of it isn't managed in a way that is uh, conducive to having horses out on it, uh, you know, all day long. So the type of seed that you use on your fields uh, is really important. A lot of horse pasture seed only has a few uh, different grass varieties and uh, it, it, the more varieties you can get, the better. Um, so, so that's one of the major issues with uh, regular grass seed is that it's just not diverse enough. And a lot of times um, there are a lot of really high sugar types of grass included. And yes, it tastes amazing, but it's not necessarily what's the best thing for long-term equine foraging uh, for them. So um, that's kind of the, the other thing. You also have to make sure that you're mowing the grass correctly, you're cutting the grass so that it's not growing up huge and lush and then you're just putting the horses out on it. I do have a friend who um, actually has cows miniature cows <laughs> and she rotates her miniature cows onto the field before she puts the horses out they kind of eat it all down and then they put the horses out on it once it's been kind of um you know accessed by the cows for a bit so it makes it a lot better grazing for a horse because they they can't really handle going out onto that really lush grass if they haven't been on it all winter or for a long period of time um, so yeah, the more risk factors that you have from that last slide that I showed you, oops, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, this will determine kind of your horse's risk of developing uh, a metabolic problem or laminitis in the future. And um, it'll really impede their recovery or management of these diseases as well. So it's really important to um, be looking at all of these factors. Um, cortisol, like I said, the cortisol and adrenaline, adrenaline uh, fight or flight response is, um, I think we underestimate how stressed horses can be because they can be very stoic looking, um, but uh, a lot of horses are having these fight or flight um, type scenario going on, or they're just, you know, if you have a horse in small spaces for long periods of time, they do get really pent up. And then they, uh, you know, I have a horse, if I have to keep him too pent up, when I take him out somewhere, somewhere new, he just explodes and he's just, a, he's on fire. So I have to make sure that um, you know he's getting enough movement, he's getting enough exercise that he can bring that cortisol and adrenaline down to a point where he's just kind of like good with everything that's going on. So horse shows another one where horses can get in really into that fight or flight response. Um, and uh, so when we talk about Cushing's and um, insulin dysregulation and how that all um, works together to uh, cause a laminitic episode. Um, so other things that can affect a horse um, and either put them at risk for metabolic disease or laminitis uh, is liver and kidney stress. So the liver is, um, the liver can actually, does play a part in um, the input and output of glucose as well. So especially in that stress, that fight or flight response, it actually outputs glucose 
in that situation. So um, that puts more pressure on the horse to develop more insulin um, and in an already overloaded insulin system, you're, you're adding more fire to the problem. So um, gut disease, which also affects the liver and the kidneys um, and the metabolic system, the neurological system, um, that can also have a huge part to play, especially if they have chronic um, gut problems for, for a long time. And sometimes these issues can be um, hard to uh, assess and it might look really subtle and because the gut is on the inside, it can sometimes be hard to figure out if that is a contributing factor. So it's really important to remember that um, supporting the gut is never a bad thing. And then footing is a really big thing. So the type of footing that you're using in your paddocks, the type of footing you're riding your horses on, um, those will all play a part in how much um, you know, pressure and uh, circulation and all of those types of things that uh, can allow the, the foot and the leg to get oxygenated properly. So um, I know there's a lot of uh, far infrared studies being done on horses to see what kind of circulation is going on in their feet. And a lot of horses that have um, had laminitis or are pre-laminitic or at risk for laminitis have very little um, heat in the bottom parts of their legs. So there's a circulatory issue going on well before the actual laminitis occurs. Uh, this can also happen with shoeing as well. So that's also really important. Um, chronic inflammation, like I said, can be anywhere in the body. So it can affect the neurological system, which can stress the pituitary gland, which can cause insulin resistance. Um, and then uh, obviously liver and kidney stress, like I said before, it can also do the same thing. Um, neurological stress itself, either through sleep or through um, behavioral stress from environment, um, also can dysregulate insulin and cause the same uh, same risk factors. And then lack of movement as well. A lot of times that, that contributes to obesity, but also contributes to heightened cortisol as well. So um, yeah, so the other thing about hay is that it doesn't contain a lot of water. So horses also have to drink a lot more water when they're only consuming hay, whereas when they're eating some forage, like natural forage, they're actually getting a lot more moisture in their diet, which helps their kidneys work better and um, brings the stress level off their bodies a little bit. Um, extruded feeds can also do the same thing unless they're, you're using water with them. So I always encourage people to not feed dry, um, dry feed because it makes your horse hotter, it makes them internally hotter, it can increase inflammation, especially in the gut. Um, and it can also dehydrate them because they need to take water from their bodies to uh, get that dry feed into a state that their body can actually digest and break down and use. So then they have to drink more water and they can have a delayed dehydration response from that. Um, glyphosate, already talked about that, um, overuse of antibiotics and immune suppressive drugs and vaccines, and um, a really sterile environment that, that is, um, you know, a sterile ground that doesn't have a root or soil system. Um, and I also mean like socially sterile as well. So a lot of horses have like, um, you know, either some kind of barrier in between them and other horses uh, or hot wire between them and other horses they are not able to socialize properly and um, not able to groom each other. And that actually releases a lot of stress for them as well. So those kind of situations, you know, some horses are not that great with other horses, but if they really enjoy being with other horses, it's important to, to allow them to have access to that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about equine metabolic 
syndrome versus PPID, which is Cushing's. So some people think they're the same thing, um, but they're actually two separate things um, that can get confused because they both do involve insulin dysregulation. But EMS is a heightened um, insulin levels in the bloodstream. So usually um, a horse will get a blood test and they may have a lot of insulin in their bloodstream. Insulin is secreted mostly largely by the pancreas. Um, and what happens with uh, metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance is that the receptors um, in the cells that take up insulin, they, they stop being sensitive to that. So um, that's why they call it insulin resistance. So it's not able to take up insulin and, and the horse loses its ability to um, metabolize sugar. So this is really important. This can happen largely, the biggest cause is obesity. Um, some people say it's genetic, but um, you know, genetics ties in a little bit, but you know, does doesn't really matter what kind of horse or, or pony that you have um, if you're if you're really thinking ahead. So sometimes you can't because you get the horse later on. So there's always that as well. Um, so if you're seeing excess insulin in the bloodstream, that's usually what they will diagnose your horse with is insulin resistance. Now, a lot of times if that's happening, your vet will recommend that you have an ACTH test done, which is a Cushing's test. So that is to see if the ACTH is elevated, which comes from the pituitary, which is at the base of the um, brain, that means that your horse actually has Cushing's. But if that level isn't raised, then they're only insulin resistant. So the um, in, increased ACTH can also dysregulate insulin. So it could be that your horse has Cushing's and it could be that they just have insulin resistance. Um, so because uh, Cushing's is also considered to be a neurodegenerative disease, um, that's why I'm talking so much about stress because um, it, it is related to the brain and a, a, a gland that is very close to the brain. So it has a huge factor in neurological diseases as well. So a lot of horses that you see with Cushing's may develop some kind of neurological dysfunction as they age as well. So that's just to, to make it really clear about the distinction between those two things. Um, and one of the really interesting things that I um, was reading in all the research that I was doing is that uh, and I, I cited the, the article in, we have a blog on laminitis, we have a blog on EMS, and we have a blog on Cushing's all on the, um, on the equine blog on adoredbeast.can.com. Uh, uh, so if you want to take a look at the actual um, uh, link that I uh, posted on there, um, it was really interesting to see that there are some specialist vets that are now starting to um, study whether or not um, insulin is being misinterpreted uh, as insulin growth factor, which is another hormone that looks like insulin, but it has a very different um, uh, very different function. So insulin growth like factor is a growth hormone that is involved in uh, the growth of the laminar, lamellar tissue of the legs and the feet. So there are some vets that believe that this massive uptick in insulin, it actually dis this whole metabolic issue is that the metabolic system becomes less intelligent and less able to discern these different 
hormones and the receptors actually take up the wrong hormone and it can actually send them down this laminitic road. So that I thought that was really interesting because you don't usually hear that from very many um, sources. It's usually that um, insulin is the issue, but insulin growth factor, growth hormone um, is, is possibly another factor. So it's very interesting. New science is always coming out. It's very cool to read. Um, and then the keys to preventing and reducing symptoms, we've kind of already talked about all of these. Um, so stress reduction is, is like my number one thing. So that means social, making sure that your horse is socially satisfied, socially happy, um, you know, that they have some buddies that they get along with, uh, you know, horses that live alone that in itself can be very, very stressful, unless you have a very aggressive horse that really doesn't do well with other horses. And then that can be a stress for them. Um, the type of training you're doing with your horse, um, can also be a factor. So really being honest with, you know, what your goals are and what your horse's abilities are and where they're at at this time. And, you know, being really respectful that, you know, some horses don't accelerate their training at the same as other horses. And my opinion is that going slow and steady is always better. Um, you know, I know we all have our goals for, you know, in sport. Um, but I feel like we, we do have to kind of respect, you know, your horse's individual pace as well. Um, also betting is an extremely huge one because it, it really, there's been a lot of studies showing that um, the type of betting and the, the depth of betting will actually change your horse's behavior in terms of how much they lie down, how much they, you know, fully put their head down and lie down, which they need to do for six hours a night to, to be fully rested. Um, they can't just rest standing up all the time. A lot of horses start to collapse. They're in that situation. Um, and that can affect everything. We all know how it feels to even have like one or two bad nights of sleep. Um, so imagine having that all the time. It would just be absolutely horrendous. So that's a really important factor. Diet, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit more. I do have a blog on the equine section of our blog. Uh, it's all about how to formulate a really healthy glyphosate free, high fiber, low sugar diet for your horse. It's um, not as hard as you think. And um, you can use so many different herbs and um, there are some nice clean um, sources of like beet pulp now, which is something that I like to use, but it has to be molasses free. It has to be glyphosate free. It's a really great so source of fiber, especially for horses that are having issues with um, sugar um, metabolism. You really want to get their fiber levels up. Um, you want to get your hay tested if you don't already know where your hay is at and, um, you know, making sure that that's really under control. Um, protein is also another, uh, besides fiber is another glucose regulator. So a lot of horses are not actually getting enough protein, which means they're not getting enough amino acids, which can affect the whole entire system as well. So very important to uh, adjust all of those basic things. And then we'll talk about some nutraceuticals and um, herbs that might be indicated for a horse in a laminitic Cushingoid state as well. Um, living food, hand grazing or pasture, uh, obviously in a controlled way um, within a um, you know, whatever suitable for that horse, even 15 minutes a day is better than nothing. So, um, that's something that I always try to encourage people to do, um, increasing their mobility. That doesn't mean they have to do really hard work all the time, just even getting them, hand walking them, um, moving them around, uh, more frequently, and, um, you know, if, if they're ever living in just a stall, getting them into an in-out situation where they're never standing in one spot, 
um, where they can move around a lot more and encouraging more of that um, just gentle movement is really great. Um, eliminate, eliminating glyphosate, which I talked about, herbs and nutraceuticals, we'll talk about in a second, and um, avoiding steroids and antibiotics unless it's completely necessary. So um, unfortunately, a lot of horses that have asthma um, are at risk for developing laminitis because they have to go on dexamethasone to deal with their breathing. So a lot of these horses can um, be at really high risk. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, things you can do to help them through that um, and strengthen their, their lungs as well. Um, we're gonna do a uh, lung health specific talk at some point as well, because um, that's a whole other thing that kind of feeds in, into this. Um, and then vaccines, um, I'm a super minimalist when it comes to that. Um, I do a lot of titer testing instead of vaccinating all the time, uh, because every time you vaccinate, you're stimulating the immune system, causing an inflammatory response. So if you have a horse that's already really stressed out, you know, for whatever reasons, um, and then you add that inflammatory stress on top of that, it might not be doing what you hope it's gonna do. It might actually be hindering that. So that's a really, um, you gotta, you know, make the right decision for each horse. Um, okay, so herbs and prebiotics, uh, very, there's tons, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but these are really highly indicated for, for these specific diseases. So chastberry or vitex, which probably a lot of people have heard of, um, you want to make sure that all of your herbs are either wild crafted or certified organic. Um, because they can kind of work against you if they're not grown that way. Wildcrafted is actually my favorite um, because it means it's being grown in a natural environment. It's grown outside. Um, and the nutritional and medicinal value of that herb or the um, medicinal mushrooms or whatever you're using is going to be much higher value and much more effective in the long run. Run. So um, it, it does pay to try and find um, those, those options. So chastberry is amazing for pituitary support. It is uh, an, an overall metabolic um, supporter. It's very well known. There's lots of studies on this specific herb. And also as far as for insulin resistance, it also calms the adrenal glands and it's also indicated for, um, even for um, reproductive health and grumpy mares that go have really bad heat cycles and all of that kind of stuff. So it's very metabolically orientated and it can help to, to um, help these metabolic cycles kind of work in a more harmonious way with your horse's body. <laughs> um, and then rosehip and grapeseed are, are two uh, that help to increase dopamine production, which is often an issue with horses that have Cushing's. Um, so if you have a horse that's truly Cushing's, uh, rosehip and grapeseed are both great. They are also really high in antioxidants, vitamin C, uh, and, and horses that are in this state often have, it's a vicious cycle as far as like creating more inflammatory response in the body. So you want to give them as much access to antioxidants as possible to counteract all of that extra inflammation that they might be dealing with. Um, Hawthorne and nettle are both supportive for blood circulation and oxygenation. So for laminitis, this is like the number one thing you want to pay attention to. You want to get the blood moving. You want to get the legs oxygenated. You want to get that all moving more than it is at the moment. So also that's why it's really good to have some kind of way of moving them around more because that also increases their um, circulation and ox oxygenation of their feet and their legs. Um, milk thistle and dandelion 
uh, that supports the kidney, the liver, and um, that those two organs take a big hit when your horse has Cushing's disease. Um, so oftentimes horses that are laminitic either have Cushing's or insulin resistance. So these are two really amazing herbs that can just help to support all those internal organs and um, take a little bit of the stress off. Um, adaptogenic herbs are another one that I really like to use with uh, with any horse basically <laughs> that has any sort of inflammation. Um, so ashwagandha is a big one. Lots of people know that one. So again, make sure it's well crafted. And um, medicinal mushrooms are just absolutely amazing. Um, specifically chaga, which is very well documented at helping um, with resensitizing cells um, to insulin. So if you're insulin resistant, diabetic, as a human, there's tons and tons of studies on um, how that can help. So uh, chaga is a really amazing medicinal mushroom that can be used for, for this specific issue. Um, nutraceuticals, so omega-3 fats, uh, I always talk about these. So most horses are not getting enough of them and um, they're not that hard to provide. And uh, they don't need as much as like dogs and cats need, but, but it is really beneficial and helps to reduce inflammation. Also, if you're using like um, fresh busted flax, um, that provides a lot of lignans and also a lot of fiber, uh, really unique types of fiber that can help to not only um, help to regulate their insulin, um, also, it helps with hormone modulation and immune modulation. So um, it's, it's a overall a very important um, thing to remember. So anything high in grain is going to be high in omega-6s. So you always have to be balancing out their diet. Actually, you should be taking them off of any kind of grains if they are in this state. Um, but, uh, you can increase their omega threes to help increase their ability to regulate these systems as well. It also helps to, um, you know, if they've had a laminitic episode and they've come out of it and their hooves aren't growing properly, this can help to get the growth to start, um, uh, coming out in a healthier way. Um, Probiotics and prebiotics uh, are also a really important factor. So I, I haven't really talked a lot about gut health in this talk because it's a whole other subject and I talk about it all the time. So I'm sure you're bored of hearing me talk about it at this point, but um, we do have on, uh, on our YouTube channel and in our blog, we have tons of information on how to support the gut. Um, probiotics are kind of like one of the pieces, omega-3s are another piece, uh, really solid uh, diet and then stress reduction, all of these things, they all play into um, gut health as well. So, uh, and the, the healthier your horse's gut is, the healthier their immune system will be, their metabolic system, neurologic system, cardiovascular, all the systems will, will work better if you're focusing on supporting that area. Um, and again, with, with the modern way that we take care of horses, um, colic and ulcers are, are a huge um, epidemic issue. And so, you know, it's really important to think about these things because so many horses are having this problem. Uh, another one, uh, nutraceutical that's really useful for insulin um, regulation is chromium, which, um, you know, is, is a micro mineral, uh, but it, it's not often added to feed or food or even a lot of, uh, mineral, um, supplements and things will not include chromium. So it, it does help to have this one on board. If you have a horse that has insulin resistance, um, it can really help uh, a lot of horses to, to deal with that. Also, um, another factor in um, 
a lot of horses lives i thought it was just over here in the west um, that we have really high iron in our well water um, and in the groundwater uh, but apparently in the east coast it's the same um, so there are if you have really high iron in your water it can um, mean that you have to supplement with more zinc and more copper to offset that high iron level. So that can also cause issues with the metabolic system and also the neurological system. So it's important to pay attention to that. If you don't know what your water is, it would be um, a good idea to get it tested and see if that's something that you need to um, adjust in your horse's uh, mineral plan. Um, yeah, just talked about minerals, um, doing an actual stress assessment, um, as to where you can actually improve and where it might be harder to improve things. Um, it's, it's just really important anywhere where you feel like maybe there might be a better option for your horse. Um, you know, e even if that means moving them to a different place, um, to get them, into a situation that works better for them, it's so worth worth it because um, if your horse is happy, then uh, it's going to make a big difference as to how they're going to be able to manage themselves through um, these diseases. And then homeopathy is something that we use quite a lot with Cushing's horses. Um, if if you're going to use homeopathy specifically for this, um, I would recommend working with a homeopath uh, because they're because it's a chronic disease um, you want to make sure that you have a, a, you know a homeopath really closely assess exactly you know what kind of temperament they have and um, you know how their their specific disease process is representing um, and presenting because it will make a difference as to what homeopathic remedies might be um, indicated for them. So uh, well worth it to, to explore that with a homeopath as well. So I think that was pretty fast. I don't know if it was fast, um, but I <laughs> want to give you guys a chance to ask questions. So um, I'm going to shut up now so that we can do that. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> no problem. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks for putting that together for us. Um, yeah. Yes, there is a few questions. Um, Laureen, why don't I give you the mic so that you can ask Sarah live if you feel comfortable with that. If not, I don't mind asking. Mm, that's fine. Hey, hi. Hi. I mean, <clears throat> Ah, uh, what were my questions? I completely forgot. Oh, okay, so here's the first one. Do you have any oh. suggestions for or alternatives instead of antibiotics? Oh, do you mean for infections? Yes, I was specifically, I was looking into oil of oregano, actually. Um, yeah, that's one option, for sure. But the problem I'm having is that I have no clue as to quantity, how much, how to do any of that. There, I have yet to find that sort of information. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, so I, I am always one to ask, what are you using antibiotics for? Because, um, I work with a lot of horse owners and I, you know, I'm around a lot of horses and I see a lot of different veterinarians recommending antibiotics for things that I would actually say no to, to using antibiotics for. So um, in particular, when horses cut themselves and they have swelling and then they go on 10 days of antibiotics. <laughs> and this is like something that really stresses me out because you're basically uh, just because a horse has inflammation does not mean that they have an infection. Um, and uh, antibiotics are really not going to give your horse a benefit if they're not 
being used in a way that is a little bit more targeted. So a lot of times, you know, unless it's an emergency situation where, you know, your horse is life and death situation where you have to go into full spectrum antibiotic. Okay. That's totally fair. And that's what antibiotics are for. Um, but in these other scenarios, if it's not a life-threatening situation, I always say that in, personally, it's better to wait and watch, give homeopathics. Um, if, if it continues to get worse over a couple of days um, and your horse is very uncomfortable, it might be worth considering using antibiotics. Um, but also if you're going to use them, it, you know, you getting a, uh, a culture done to make sure that you're using the correct antibiotics to deal with the actual infection or bacteria that is, is, um, affecting your horse. And then once you use antibiotics, there has to be a care plan or recovery plan put in place after they're given. So not that antibiotics are a bad thing always, um, but like oil of oregano would be wonderful in those situations where it's highly antimicrobial. It doesn't really matter what type of um, bacteria it is because the whole uh, mechanism of it is to help deal with all of them. Whereas a lot of antibiotics are meant to only deal with specific strains. Um, so it, that's always the first thing that I ask is like, why do you need, why do you want to use antibiotics? Cause for me, I, I always want to, um, I don't want to risk damaging their gut microbiome because they have some swelling in their leg or they have a cut or something like that. So I, I see that a lot and I, it, it's something that I just wouldn't do with my horses. So that's why I'm asking. Cause, cause this is something that people have this knee jerk reaction to do. Um, and it's not always warranted to give them. So it does pay to have some alternatives on, on, your side. So what, what types of things would you even want to use the oil of oregano for? Specifically right now, I I'm totally on board with what you're saying here. I rarely ever do. And, and what I have two horses and one of them is very much my canary in a coal mine and mm -hmm. does not do well with antibiotics. Right. And, and that one is a very long story, but, um, I have actually discovered an alternative, but again, I don't know, I don't know quantities or duration, but I did actually manage to cure that horse of a very, very significant um, infection, um, a guttural pouch infection. He was mm -hmm. x-rayed, he had all, he went through all kinds of stuff, yeah. all kinds of sulfur drugs and you name it, whatever. We went round and round with all kinds of things. And this is how I discovered how incredibly sensitive he is mm. and he just did not do well with that and I just it helped me on this natural path let's put it that way nice. but um in the course of that I discovered um an herb called uh well I call it smart weed it has actually a lot of different names to it it's got a lot of antibacterial properties I just started harvesting it because I have it everywhere out here um uh midsummer through fall I started harvesting it and I did a lot of testing uh, with this horse on it. And there was absolutely no question that his cough and discharge um, got better yeah. while I used it. Great. Every time I tried to quit, it just got worse. Right. So I kept him on it for, I, it probably took a year, which is why I don't know, um, but I could find no information. Um, as to how much I should be using. And I had to end up ordering uh, the seeds, Smartweed seeds. Um, I found a company that uh, sold that uh, and I fed him that all through the winter, about six tablespoons of them actually. Right. I don't know why I came up with that amount, but I just did. And eventually we were at a point where the only thing left what I was being told is surgery. 
to right. cleaning out, fix him, whatever. And, he, and I so, so did not want to go down that road. And I'm so thankful I did not Good. get pushed so, into it for any reason. But, and it was expensive. Right. Yeah. No, but, that's, that's definitely not, not a, a small thing. <laughs> um, but I wanted to put that out there, even though that's not what I'm dealing with right now, because it was such an incredible thing for me to discover. Um, and it worked so well. But yep. again, yeah, like I said, I didn't quite a know few if I... different um, herbs that can be used in that way that are antimicrobial. Um, there's a really great book. Uh, let me see if I can see it here. Let me grab it. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, it's called Equine Herbs and Healing by Maya Cointro. Um, that's one of my go-to books for herbs. And the reason I'm saying that it's good to have some books on hand is because different herbs are indicated for different things. And the amount that you might use might vary from horse to horse. I think I have one more book. What was the author on that one again? Um, oh yeah, this one. Um, this, this one's by Maya, Maya M-A-Y-A Cointro. And then um, this is the other one that I use a lot. It's called uh, The Modern Horse Herbal. And this is a great reference book as well. And it, it will go through a bunch of herbs that um, are indicated for the same sorts of things, but then it'll kind of break it down into more specifics for you so that um, you can pick the one that is most indicated for the horse. And oftentimes, you know, a regular sized horse I generally will start really low for a few days just to make sure that the horse isn't going to like break out in hives or something from, from a large amount. Um, and then once I know that it works for them, usually between a quarter and a half cup of like loose leaf or, you know, as long as it's not in a powdered form or an extract form, um, you can use usually use around that much. Uh, it will vary, like I said, between horses. And then um, some horses do better with, depending on what it is, um, with tea rather than with the herb itself. So sometimes if, you know, you're dealing with a really sick horse, um, a tea version might be better, um, but it, it'll be um, easier if you have some some reference books with you because there's so many herbs that I could suggest but it really does depend on what's going on in the moment as to what um, might be indicated. I wrote those down I'm going to look into yeah, that. They're really but really good ones. Specifically I was asking because my mare has developed a, a cough the last week and she was coughing quite a bit one time and now and then had a lot of discharge. Okay. Which um, concerned me a bit. And I actually, the smart weed that kind of came up quite rapidly here all of a sudden, a little late in the year, but uh, I started feeding her smart weed and actually it has calmed her cough and got her a lot better and she's had no discharge. Right. So I figured I'd just keep her on that right now um, until I don't have any more. Yeah, there, there are, um, I mean, and even then like a cough might not be, uh, from the bacterial infection, right? Yeah. The discharge is what looked like an infection. Um, I mean, I haven't had it tested, but, um, and she, it was only the one time. So I don't know how I would get a sample right now anyway. And, and it's gotten better. So I don't know, but that was why I asked about the oil of oregano because I was trying to look into other alternatives too. Um, I would get these books. I so, will. I have the horses, so they exactly what I need. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is what I like. I people think I'm crazy, but the stuff, the natural way works. It does. It, it works so well. And my horses have never been healthier. That's They're sweet. older now, but I swear they are healthier now. Um, 
than they were um, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have a, a, a blog coming out next week for, for those of us that have young horses and because it's my favorite thing to talk about because if you do this when they're young, it is just absolute, it just makes all the difference in the long run. So I know it's not always possible when you buy an older horse, but when they're young and you have them right from the start or, you know, from the time they're one or two and you employ some of these easy techniques, make sure their diet is correct, um, you know, and, and just take these principles, you know, into your mind as, as really important factors for your horse to stay healthy. Um, it, it just serves them for their entire life. So, and then it reminds us to, to think of these things for ourselves too. <laughs> See, I want to do that now. I've actually raised four babies and the two that I have, my two older horses right now, I bred them and raised them myself and I still have them, but I, I didn't know. I mean, the mare is 24, 24 now. I mean, so I didn't know a lot of this stuff back then. That's great. I started out with that whole path. So you're not I, doing too bad then. <laughs> no, they're doing good, but I feel I wish I had known so much more, but that's just the way the nature of it. Um you, you're best. They're doing fantastic. That's they awesome. are really doing fantastic. That's great. So I'm happy. I just wish they were younger at this point. <laughs> yes. We always hope that wish they would last forever. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, well, that's why I wish I had known more earlier, so that yeah. maybe I could have made but things you know better. You can always apply it now, and you then you're still doing it, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I will never look back. I, I will never go back to ways I, you know, the old ways. I just won't. That's great. I'm glad. Thank you. Your horses are very lucky. <laughs> I just have to keep talking about it to more and more people because yeah. it's a little bit shocking to me to realize um how little people in the horse world actually understand and get you know the gut health the over vaccination all of these things that is being talked about a lot more like with dogs and cats and stuff um it, it seems more readily available even though it still feels a minority but still it's there, but when you get talking about the horses, which I bring them up every time I get into these discussions, because I'm like, what about my horses? Yeah, I need to know more. I get it with the dogs and cats, but what about the horses? Yeah, I know. That's I get a lot of this we we definitely need an upgrade. <laughs> Yeah, yeah Thank but you. I'm trying to be the squeaky wheel, and but I get a lot of blank stares and a lot of they don't get it and I, I don't always know um how to try to get that point across it's just so foreign to the vast majority of them they just don't make the connection it's I'll true keep working on it but you're doing a great job i just wanted to say i love these and, and i'm always learning i don't have you know a cushings or a lemon in a course or anything but i just like to learn whatever i can awesome thank you and so actually, much. even though i don't i was noticing there was an awful lot in your presentation that was still uh relevant to everybody yes and that's why i tuned in awesome. i'm glad <laughs> so, you did. yeah i guess we just got to keep talking about it yes <laughs> i will I'm, sorry. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty stubborn so <laughs> thank you so much thank you um, there's one more question here, Sarah, but before I get to that, I forgot to tell everyone that's with us tonight that um, we opened up the equine sale that's going to be happening this weekend. We opened it up for attendees. So the coupon is live now and it's NEIGH15, N-E-I-G-H-15. That'll save you 15% off all ABA equine products. Um, awesome. And then there's one question here from Christy. Let me pull that up. Um, she had a horse. She's not here tonight, Sarah, but she'll watch the recording. She had a horse that's flank was twitching frequently. Blood test came back low WBC. Um, and she was looking for suggestions or any ideas that you may have. Oh, sure. Um, well, if, if there's twitching involved, 
Uh, it's generally something nervous system related. And um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that could be causing that. Um, but the first things that pop into my mind are like lion's mane mushrooms, um, ashwagandha, um, making sure that there um, isn't anything in the diet that could be uh, or in their life that's causing neurological stress like we talked about because um, you know, any of those factors can definitely contribute. Um, but yeah, for twitching and um, sensitivity, skin sensitivity, uh, you know, all of these types of little neurological ticks and things like that, um, lion's mane mushrooms are really highly indicated for that. Um, that would probably be my first suggestion. And then uh, gut support for sure. Uh, making sure that they're they're on some really good probiotics and uh, prebiotics as well. I, I would need more information to specifically suggest anything else, I think, but usually for nervous system issues, I always recommend lion's mane. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, I think we went through Lorene's questions and I don't have any more for us this evening, but I oh, will post... Yeah, we did. We did okay here, time wise. Yeah, we did. I'll post the recording tomorrow or the next day on our YouTube channel for anyone that um, wants to go back and look. It'll be made available for you. And don't forget the code NAY15. It's 15% off anything from the ABA equine line. Awesome. Yeah, and you can check out the blog. There's uh, one blog for each thing or EMS, uh, one for Cushing's, and one for. Uh, laminitis as well. So I go a little bit more into each one of those things and, and some of the science behind it uh, in those articles as well. Thanks, Sarah. I'm just going to link those one more time for everyone in the chat if you want to copy and paste, or you can just search like Sarah said on our blog and they'll pop up for you. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next month for another ABA Equine with Sarah. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Steph. Bye. Good night. Bye.